So we get up next to the hive and Simon gets out his crowbar and he cranks the lid off and 70,000 of the most enraged African bees rise up in a black cloud around me. People ask me a lot, like, what's the most dangerous encounter you've had in nature? And, you know, by this stage of the podcast, you know, a crocodile tried to ingest me and that wasn't the worst. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I became fascinated by bees for a few reasons. The one is that one day I was walking in the wild part of Zimbabwe and I came across this ancient baobab tree, this two-story high baobab tree, and it had been hollowed out by an, when an elephant had knocked the branch, and it was in fact empty. And a swarm of bees had made their hive in the top of it, and the sound of the bees humming was coming down the base of that tree, and it was like standing next to this giant didgeridoo. And just the sort of, I could hear the intensity of the bees through this process, and I felt the, their vibration coming out of this tree, and it, was, it kind of sparked my interest. There's also an amazing thing in, so- in Southern Africa. There's a bird called the honey guide. And literally, if you go out in parts of wilderness in Africa and you start banging on trees, a bird will come to you and it will start to call incredibly animatedly, very much like Disney's, I think he wants us to follow him. And then it will fly in front of you and show you where the beehive is so that like for thousands of years before, as a hunter-gatherer, you can rob the beehive And then you put some honey down next to you and the bird comes and lands next to you and eats the honey. It's this incredible ancient, just, you know, an encounter like that. Like it just takes you back thousands of years in an instant. Wow. So wait, just, just for clarity. So this is, so this is like thousands, tens of thousands, who knows, hundreds of thousands of years of co-evolution where this bird has a species memory of a symbiotic relationship with humanoids. Is that what I'm hearing? A type of morphogenic field memory. That's nuts. And when it sees a person, it knows we go and get honey together. Wow. I mean, isn't that amazing? That's cool. And you walk out to remote places and suddenly the bird's there and it's like, come on, let's do this. Are we going to do this? And it it almost appears to get disappointed if you're like, I'm not going to go and rob the beehive now. Wow. So anyway, like I was around with this idea and I was like, the bees are really fascinating. And then I started reading up on them and it's this incredible creature, right? They pollinate millions of flowers. They're one of the biggest contributors from the insect world to the economy, honey sales. They can feel electromagnetic fields. They will disappear if a storm is brewing. And then as you watch the hive itself, this incredible kind of algorithmic intelligence whereby a single bee, an individual bee, responds to localized stimuli doing what it knows to do. And when enough bees responding to individual localized stimuli all start to attune an algorithm fires through the hive and they move as one and they know where to go and get food, etc. So that idea also gripped me, the idea of individuals attuning to what they know to do can trigger a kind of a collective transformation. So I got really into this. And That's all the good stuff. There was a bit of backstory <laughs> here before my near-death experience. So wait, I should tell you that during the time that I got fascinated about bees, there was a couple who were coming on safari and they had been writing to me from Singapore And they were saying, listen, we want to come to Africa, but we're terrified of Ebola. And I had said to them, listen, Ebola is in, you know, North and West Africa. There's no Ebola in South Africa. Yeah, but we're very, very afraid of it. We're very concerned that it could travel. I said, you really have to trust me. There is no Ebola in South Africa. You're going to be absolutely safe. So they had come on safari. Meantime, I walk up into the back of the village and I seek out a man by the name of Simon Sambo. Simon Sambo. Great name himself has a mellifluous voice, very soft, lilting voice. And Simon Sambo is the village beekeeper. So I say to him, Simon, I've got really interested in bees and I know that you have some hives and I would love to come and experience your beekeeping. He says, okay, there's no problem. I can take you beekeeping. I said, great, I'm excited about this. He says, you meet me tomorrow in the morning and we will go and meet the bees. Great. Next morning I meet him and he's got a big sort of black plastic case and we drive out to the hives and I'm inappropriately dressed. I'm in like shorts and t-shirt. And I said, what do we do now? He says, uh, okay, the first thing is you must put on your beekeeping suit. So he gives me his suit and I, I put it on and it's a little bit short for me. 
like literally between my sneaker and my ankle, I have some exposure. So I said to him, Simon, the, the suit's a bit short for me because he had sort of, this was his second suit. He says, oh, don't worry, you can borrow my socks. So he takes his boots off and he's got thick black socks. And so I sort of feel them and I think, okay, this is going to be good. And I put the socks on and I like seal up the suit. And I say to him, cool, Simon, let's get the smoker going now. He says, oh, no, I don't use the smoker. It makes the bees afraid of a fire. So like a little bell goes off in my head. I'm like, but beekeepers all over the world use the smoker. He says, it's not my style. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm here to learn. And so Simon and I start heading towards the hives. And I'm talking African bees here. Now, Tim, amazing thing happens. As you approach the hive, if you just walk past the hive with no intention of doing anything, the bees somehow know it. But the minute you put your intention and attention on them, I don't know how, you know, it's maybe too woo, but I'm telling you they feel it. And as you start walking towards the hive, they start changing gears like they're at the Austin F1 track. And you hear the sound changing. So we get up next to the hive and Simon gets out his crowbar and he cranks the lid off. And 70,000 of the most enraged African bees rise up in a black cloud around me. And they're shimmering around me. And you can feel the intensity and you can feel their attitude of, Oh, you think you can fuck with us. And they're all around you and they start to land on you. And it, I, you know, someone who's grown up around animals, I feel the energy of a single angry, aggressive animal. And they're all over me. And I say, Simon, this is quite intense. He says, don't worry, everything's okay. And they start landing on the visor and like blocking the visor out. And it's super intense. And right at that moment, in the midst of this like raw buzzing intensity, one bee found my weak sock area and it stung me through the sock. And the minute as that sting went through the sock, a, a huge pheromonal cascade was released to the other bees and the shimmering, swarming dark mass around my head, it stopped for a second. And then as one, the bees went to my ankles. And oh, they God. begin to sting me intensely through the socks. The socks do not work. So I was like, Simon, Simon, they're stinging me. Simon, Simon, they're stinging me. What must I do? What must I do? He says, okay, uh, back away. And they start following me. And then now I'm being stung hundreds of times. And then at one stage, I look up and there's a bee that has, it, that's inside the suit. So eventually I get into the clearing and now I have a swarm of bees around me. They are still penetrating the sock badly. I say, Simon, what must I do? What must I do? He says, uh, hold on, I will help you. And he runs over and he cuts a large branch of a tree. And then he runs back and he starts beating me with the branch. And I'm standing in the clearing getting pounded with the branch. And they're still stinging me. They're still all around me. I say, Simon, it's not working. It's not working. He says, okay, I will get the smoker going. And I just, the thought ran to my head, like a little late for that. He grabs the smoke, he starts putting <laughs> elephant dung in it, and then he gets it going and he comes over to me and he starts blasting me with the smoker. And the first blast went right through the visor of the beekeeping <laughs> suit and kind of into my mouth. And so I got a big inhale of elephant dung. And then my mind I, and my t chest immediately tightened up. I started thinking, shit, my whole body's going into anaphylaxis. Is it elephant dung or is it anaphylaxis? And they're still stinging me and it's bad. I said, him, Simon, they're still stinging me. They're still stinging me. He says, Oh, okay, run for your life. <laughs> and this is when two men in beekeeping suits break into a full run through the wilderness. And we just start running aimlessly at first. And then he says, they will chase you forever. Make for the Land Rover. So we run to the Land Rover and we jump into it. And he just says, drive, drive, drive. They are enraged. <laughs> so I start driving off into the wilderness. Tim, true as nuts, we come around the first corner and on the other safari truck driving towards us is the couple from Singapore who've been afraid of Ebola and they see, what they see is the Ebola cleanup crew in full white suits driving towards them at full speed going, you're gonna die, you're gonna <laughs> die, drive, drive, drive. <laughs> and that was my first encounter with the bees. So eventually I make it back to the house and I remember I got into my, my bedroom and I sat on the bed and I was just trying to feel my own body. And I was like, am I dying? Am I, am I dying? 
am I okay? Like, is it kicking in? And I got into the shower and I like, took all the stings out of my ankles and I made it back onto my bed. And that was me for the next five days. I did not move. My, my feet looked like someone had taken um, surgical gloves and just blown them up. <laughs> <laughs> and Simon would come around and he would say, uh, uh, hey, Boyd, how are you doing today? I said, not good. He said, I bought some ice for your feet. Next time we will get you boots. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I sat with it. And what, what I took out of it was, number one, if you want to, what the bees taught me is if you want to know about the bees, respect the bees. And <laughs> the next thing that I got was I became intrigued by the power of this collective ability to fire the con like the collective consciousness algorithm. Like what would it mean if we all started really attending to states of peace and healing and well-being? And, and if enough of us did that, could we like the bees, you know, create some kind of algorithmic transformation for everyone. So I got a lot out of it. <laughs>